I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times. Welcome to The New York Times Close Up. Where were we when we were so rudely interrupted by snow? Well, if you were on a subway, chances were you were delayed, and if not delayed, being worried about being delayed. In a moment, my New York Times colleague, Jonathan Mahler, explains why the subject of his Sunday Times magazine cover story. We'll discuss other developments with Times reporters on the back story, and I'll provide some final words on CODA. But first, Sunday Times Magazine staff writer Jonathan Mahler, the case for the subway was the cover story in last Sunday's edition with extraordinary photographs by staff photographer Damon Winter. Jonathan, one of the things you wrote that seems sort of elemental is that the subject is obvious, the subway is obviously vital to the city. But you said that the reason economically is that cities create density, density creates growth. Is there a point where we grow too much, where we are too crowded, too congested, too dense? Um, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Um, I, and, and I think the one other thing that's, that's it, it is elemental, but I think a lot of people sort of don't, don't even think about it, don't even consider the fact that, that um, it really is the subway that makes it possible for, for companies to, and buildings to, to fill up with people every day and then to empty out at mm -hmm. the end of the day. So, um, and, in, and as you point out, Physically, realistically, technologically, there's really no alternative. No other way. There's no other way. It takes. Uh, it would take um, 2,000 single occupancy vehicles to to carry as many people into the city as as one subway train carries in. Um, in terms of, um, are we? Is there a risk of getting too dense? Uh, yes, but we are a long way from that right now. And in fact, um, uh, New York is, we think of New York as being as, you know, a very dense city, and in, in, in the United States it is. But, but compared with cities around the world, I, I don't even think New York is in the top 200. Um, so there's a lot more room for, for growth and a lot more uh, opportunity for density. I mean, not, not in, in certain neighborhoods, but, but if you look around the city, in, in Queens, for instance, um, I think not even half of the population of Queens lives within walking distance of a subway. Hmm. So lots of, lots of opportunities for growth and for, for also for, for, for demographic groups that, are, 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 you know, that could use opportunity and could use uh, hubs that get built around transit and that provide density. The governor coming up with his budget next week, the mayor, the head of the MTA, Joe Lowe, to talk about more money for the subway system. How much realistically does it need and would it be able to spend in a ideal world? An endless amount. Um, I think that, um, I mean, the, so I, I actually did some of the math in, in this piece and um, the, the, the figure I came up with, which was, was really not even everything that the subway needs, um, but was, um, was a start, I mean, a good start, I should say, uh, was over $100 billion. So now, is that in the great scheme of things a lot of money? No, uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but when you think about how much money New York City throws off every day, just just as an economic engine, I mean, it's it's close to ten percent of the country's GDP is generated in New York City. Uh, when you think about that, and when you think about the fact that. Um, Without the subway, I mean, as we've seen, as it, we remember best actually from Sandy, uh, mm -hmm. which, which you know, shut down the subway and then shut down the city completely. Without the subway, the city wouldn't be able to, 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 to work. And so, and when the city doesn't work, that's, that's you know, really like billions of dollars uh, every week. So that, that $100 plus billion dollar investment would be covered in, uh, you know, in a month's time. One of the things that we've talked about on this program numerous times is where is the will to fix the subway? This is a city of commuters. You'd think that that would count for votes. Uh, but why hasn't there been someone or people stepping forward and saying, look, we've got to do this, we've got to find the money, whether it's congestion pricing or some other tax or whatever, uh, the subway system is absolutely vital to the city. Yeah, I would say two, two things, I mean, there are a lot of explanations. Uh, the two that jump out uh, at me as, as sort of being most significant are that, that one is that the governor controls the subway, which, um, which is a kind of relic of, I, you know, I won't go into the history and you know it, but uh, uh, it's a sort of a relic of a, it's a, of, of, of a, of a 
New York City's past, a sort of historical footnote, really, that, that ended up... Uh, uh, and part of that was to insulate the system from politics. Well, it was, and, and, but it was a, a product of a moment when the city was, uh, was struggling and the state was on more stable economic footing. But, um, but obviously that's not the case any longer. And, and now you have a, a... So you have a politician in the governor who's ultimately responsible for this vital, vital piece of infrastructure for the city. Um, but, you know, more than half of his, his voters don't want their money going to the subway. So, um, so and, and meanwhile, the, the, the riders of the subway can't, can't blame the politician whom they should be able to blame, which is to say the, the mayor. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first and, and probably most sort of significant structural explanation for why there isn't, why something isn't, isn't happening. Um, there just isn't enough uh, in, in investment on, on the governor's part in the, in the subway. Uh, the other explanation I, I would offer is that I, I don't think that, that the business community currently has, has gotten exercised enough about this mm -hmm. issue. And, um, and um, I think that there are different explanations for why that is. I mean, one obvious one is that, you know, the city now, which, which was once, once um, you know, f filled with people who, who sort of the, when you think about the sort of businesses and the sort of skyscrapers in Midtown, were once filled with businesses that were based in New York. No, they were stakeholders. They were stakeholders, exactly. And now you have uh, you have um, sort of sort of absentee landlords, people from all over the world, who basically just treat treat New York skyscrapers as a as an investment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think they're not connected to the fabric of the city. They don't see what's what's happening underground, literally. Uh, and so. Um, so I think that there isn't a, 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 a sort of a, there, there isn't a sort of civic will. Um, so we have a kind of a lack of political will, and we have a lack of civic will. So what you end up with just is a lot of really frustrated riders. Um, and also, you know, as I tried to kind of show in this piece, is that you know we have a we have a kind of coming disaster. I mean, this really the the effect of the subway not not getting fixed and not just fixed but 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 improved and getting faster and better and and, and extending lines into new neighborhoods i mean that will, is going to have just a catastrophic effect on new york city and i think people can sort of see it but but nothing's being done about it so that seems to be true uh, you say that uh, replacing the signal system things like that to make up for past disinvestment or necessary to improve the system, but that the biggest handicap right now is overcrowding. How do you make the subway greater capacity? Yeah, well, the, the signal system would help uh, in, in, in the sense that it would allow more trains to be running through the system more efficiently. So you, you They just, could be closer together. They could be, they could be exactly. They could be the, the shortest distance, safe distance between each train. Um, so that would help a little bit. Uh, and, um, I mean, ultimately what needs to happen is we need more subway lines. Mm -hmm. um, we need to, you know, if you, you think uh, w when the subway was built over the course of, of, you know, really a couple of decades at the turn of the century and into the early part of the 20th century, and, um, you know, hundreds of miles were built. Mm -hmm. And since then we've, we've added, I mean, nothing. I mean, a handful of miles, really. Uh, and the city has, has continued to grow. So uh, we need, we, frankly, we need more subway lines. One of the things you suggested is uh, the MTA selling development rights. How yeah. would that work? One of the, the ways that, that sort of other cities, and Hong Kong is really the best example of this, have, have managed to fund their mass transit and their subways is, uh, is using all the value that, that, that subways create um, by, by essentially sort of bringing in real estate developers mm -hmm. and, and, and saying, well, you know, we are going to... to create an enormous amount of value for you and a huge economic opportunity when we build the subway here. So, you know, we'll give you some zoning rights and some development rights uh, to, to build over the subway, um, around the subway, in the, in the station, but you need to, to pay us to, to fund the system. And so um, New York doesn't really do that, has not been. Did we do that a little bit under Mayor Bloomberg, Dan Doctoroff, with the Hudson Yards and the number seven line extension? Well, they did something that was, um, it was it was it was something similar. Yes, mm. I mean it was it was the same idea. It was to use the idea was was to the added value of exactly. I mean it was done through the city as opposed to through the the MTA. But but yeah, and in fact it's going on now at um, right now the uh, there's a developer that's building a, a, a skyscraper over Grand Central, mm -hmm. and they are paying to to expand some of the stairwells in Grand Central because their their building is going to bring more people to Grand Central is going to bring more density. And so uh, they're, they're picking up the tab to, to, to accommodate some of that 
density. So something like that, you know, is 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 the beginning of a model for how things might work. But but you know, really, there are opportunities sort of everywhere to do this. Well, we'll keep posted. Thank you for that yeah. piece in the Sunday Times Magazine, Jonathan Mahler. In case you missed the article, you could read it at nytimes.com. Also, get another look at Damien Winter's photographs. You can also find a series of in-depth articles about the subways called Subway Failure at nytimes.com. And coming up next, the backstory when we return. <music> Mayor de Blasio sworn in on a frigid New Year's Day. Governor Andrew Cuomo delivered a blistering State of the State address. Dreamers can rest a bit more easily now that a federal court has ordered the Trump administration to maintain the DACA program for young immigrants. Joining me now to discuss these stories and more, my New York Times colleagues, contributing writers Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph, and investigative reporter David Chen. We heard from the governor in a State of the State address. We're going to hear the budget coming up. What do we have to look forward to, do you think? What should the governor be doing when he presents his budget? Well, I'd like to know, among other things, congestion pricing, what, is, is, what the details are they going to be. He avoided that term in his state of the state. He used something else that suggested congestion pricing. But uh, uh, Maybe it just needs thing. a new name. Maybe, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but, like but I, it made me, trouble. exactly, it really does. But it made me wonder if he's, if he's walking away from it. Uh, a little bit of uh, ethics reform, I know that's a, a, a Old, you know, golden oldie for us on this, but uh, something's needed. I was just looking at, at, at a list of the trials that are coming up over the next several months, and it's like one a month, another of, you know, of do, do present or former legislators. Yeah, including, you know, retrials of uh, Shelley Silver and, and Dean Skelos, uh, the former Albany leaders. And so uh, this is going to be on his plate. And the subways, ever, yeah. always the subways. You know, you're right to ask about the budget because this year especially, which is an election year, he's going to have to get everything he really wants done. He's going to have to get it done with this budget. And there are a lot of really big, I mean, um, reform is one big thing that I'm not sure anybody really wants up in Albany, but he could, he could negotiate that. That would be a big deal. But the other thing, it seems to me, that is really important, and he's talked about, is this bail reform plan. Mm -hmm. And he's not, the, the Republicans are not going to do that after the budget. They are going, that's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to say, look, let's, let's not make that part of the budget. Let's mm -hmm. not do that. That's not a budget item. Let's do it in June. But if it's not negotiated as part of this budget by the end of March, it probably won't happen. It'll be another promise that'll just evaporate. And if I could just add to that, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> he's already predicting a, a six billion dollar uh, shortfall, which, you know, we've had in the past. So that's that's looming large. I think you know, as, as someone who's uh, on a, a, a list, I don't know if it's a short list of uh, 2020 uh, contenders. It'll be interesting to see if he uh, tries to uh, pick, uh, you know, maybe one initiative that maybe has some resonance beyond. Uh, the state's borders. You know, last year, if we, if we go back, I mean, he uh, launched the Excelsior Scholarship, uh, which has been, um, you know, at least in the early going, fairly successful in terms of attracting attention and getting more uh, students to apply to CUNY and, right. and SUNY. And it'll be interesting. And that was in higher education was not an area that he had devoted a lot mm -hmm. of time uh, at all. And so it'll be interesting to see if he tries to uh, maybe take something that uh, is easy to understand well outside of New York. Is there anything he can do from a practical standpoint that negates the lack of federal tax deductibility, which Congress passed last month? Ooh, that's a big question. That's a huge question. I mean, the, the, the legalities of it are still obviously untested. Uh, to try and make, instead of taxes, some sort of charitable contribution to right, the right, state. A, a, a few payroll. towns in New Jersey are trying to do that. They're right? trying to so do that. But how do you do a charity and make it obligatory? By definition, charity is voluntary. So uh, that alone <laughs> seems to, to be a hurdle. Well, the, he did do one thing. He got... Uh, all these communities to make sure that you could take pay your 2018 property tax bill in 2017. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we now have a bill with a stamp that says paid in 2017. So that will help for for a year. But but the whole question of 
payroll taxes. Already the Republicans are saying they're not going to do, not, not going to shift to payroll taxes. From income taxes. From, uh, yeah, and, and that will, um, that if they don't do that, you know, you still got this salt that uh, is the state and local tax uh, limit that, that is really going to hurt New York. And by the way, the state, uh, the, the payroll tax thing is uh, interesting an idea as it is, won't help folks, I confess I'm one of them, who's basically part of the gig economy now, you know, who are not employees mm -hmm. uh, of a company. And um, so I don't know how you deal with that. Probably you can't. And meanwhile, the Republicans can't find anyone to run against them. Why is that? <laughs> Yeah, it's, is he that invulnerable? Well, his war chest is, uh, you know, pretty enviable, I guess, right? <laughs> he could just live off the interest. That's right. well, the, they've got a little time, not much, but they've got a, a bit of time. I don't think they're going to put up anybody really substantial uh, to run against him. And they, they're they talking about somebody to run against uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, you know, for Senate, which that's... That's 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 the kind of thing where somebody uh, makes a little tiny name for themselves to bounce to a different uh, uh, election two years down the road. Which we just had in the mayor's election because mm -hmm. certainly Nicole Meliotakis could not right. have sensibly exactly. thought she was going to defeat Perfect. Bill de Blasio. And, but now she's got a name recognition to some degree that she didn't have before. To some degree. Uh, what does it look like for Andrew Cuomo in 2020? Is he, there a realistic chance that he would run for president, much less possibly Peter win? Peter Hart used to say that he made a lot of money by making bets on people <clears throat> three years down the road about who was going to be the candidate, who was going to be the nominee, and certainly who was going to be the president. I mean, can you imagine how many people, um, you know, in 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 2012 thought that Donald Trump was even going to be the nominee. Mm -hmm. Or was he even going to run for and that And every matter. governor think of New York for sure thinks he, and so far it's only been he, uh, is a president uh, in the making. Uh, they've all run, with the exception, or, or thought of running, with the exception maybe of David Patterson in recent vintage. Maybe Hugh Carey didn't. But really, down the line, the elder Cuomo, this Cuomo, Pataki, uh, Elliot Spitzer thought he'd be the first Jewish president, uh, and uh, well, Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller for sure. <laughs> we did uh, have Teddy Roosevelt. We did have Teddy Roosevelt. Right. Uh, that was in the previous century, I do believe. Uh, oh, oh, come on. <laughs> and that was really course, to get him out of the we, state. We were in a previous century, too, so that's another matter. No, it, it's just by instinct. And every New York mayor just about thinks he's going to be, and again, so far it's only been he, um, thinks he's going to be uh, the next Superman. And we haven't had a New York uh, mayor go on to higher office since the 1860s. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a definite frequent flyer program between uh, LaGuardia <laughs> and Des Moines, right? Because de Blasio was, was there. He's, he's been trying to, you know... Knock on some doors and things, I guess. And and he is saying that his brand of pro, uh, progressivism seems to work. Is that going to sell anywhere else in the country? I don't know. I mean, he's trying to. Certainly, he's, he's got the. Uh, he's trying to uh, uh, have uh, the wide-angle shot of him with the freezing Bernie Sanders at the inauguration, uh, in terms of maybe trying to impress some people that that he's got uh, uh, his support. I mean, it, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a lot to. Uh, to ask, though, of other people who don't really know him very well, you know, outside of the city. I haven't read Fire and Fury yet, the Michael Wolf book on the president, uh, and you were saying, well, even if it's half right, uh, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Of course, the problem is we don't know which half. Which half? Uh, but for, <laughs> Brett Stevens had a very interesting column in the Times the other day pointing out that uh, the people who are against Donald Trump have succeeded so much in lowering expectations that if he just shows up at the White House, uh, he appears to be doing a good job, that there's a level of normalization, if you want to use that word, uh, that we have defined down. Oh, that's <laughs> you said it. I mean, uh, <laughs> look, he is who he is. Uh, I don't think there are too many people who are neutral about Donald Trump at this point. And, uh, uh, those among us who feel that he is unfit for this office uh, uh, may be right, but it doesn't make a difference. He's still the president. And uh, I think the only thing we're going to have to look at is the 2018 elections. And mm -hmm. you know, if we can if we can stay away from like the the biggest nuclear button in the world. 
um, you know, we and can make it to these elections, I think we'll have a chance to to, to at least have some balance somewhere. Now, right now, you don't feel it anywhere uh, except maybe in the right. courts. And you don't feel that the Democratic national bench is terribly deep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Oprah Winfrey gave a, you know, a stem winder of a speech accepting a, an award at the Golden Globes, and it was terrific. And suddenly there's all this talk, you know, she's our next president. <laughs> so is this it? You know, celebrities as president forever? Uh, if you have a reality show or you have a show like hers, uh, never mind ever having been a legislator, having been a, an, a, an executive of a state or a city or whatever, I, who knows? I mean, we well, it worked for Trump. It worked for Trump, and so now it may work for uh, a lot of people. David? Well, I mean, I, I think there's, uh, there's it, the, you talked about before about uh, uh, Brett's uh, uh, column. I think uh, some of the, um, the chatter that I, I saw in social media um, seemed to underscore that point uh, when people were talking about this unusual uh, uh, open meeting that he had with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, congressional leaders where he seemed to be uh, uh, uttering uh, uh, policy twists at, with every breath on DACA where he would be promising this and then promising that and, all, and, and that's the kind of thing I think in a different era would have been challenged by a lot of uh, different uh, uh, leaders and, and, and reporters and others and I think people ha have generally given him a little bit of a pass in terms of his inability to kind of be consistent or his, his, his tendency to kind of, you know, uh, promise, uh, you know, this to the pers last person you talk to. So that, that might be, I think, what Brett is getting at in terms of people just getting inured to the idea that he's just kind of all over the place. Well, as Eleanor said uh, earlier, you know, the 2018 elections obviously are going to be right. crucial. This is now 2018. Uh, that column pointed out that the chances of impeachment or invoking the 25th Amendment pretty slim, whether they should be or not. Uh, but how feasible is, is a real uh, sea change in 2018? Oh, it's very feasible, uh, I, I think. Uh, well, you look at all these Republicans that are resigning from Congress. Right. They, they, they see a, you know, a sea change. Yeah. They certainly see a sea, sea change. Now, the numbers are not on the Democrat side in terms of the Senate, Senate. because there's something like almost three times as many Democrats running for uh, re-election. Uh, as Republicans, so that that's a, a, a big issue, of course. Uh, even perhaps, arguably, even more important than oh, not, not more important, but uh, certainly almost as important as the uh, Congress would be state legislatures, which mm -hmm. have tended to be ignored because that's where the uh, gerrymandering takes place. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the where the census. dislocation, and we have a census coming up very soon, and that's where the dislocation really is, where you have a case like Pennsylvania where there are many, many more Republican representatives than Democrats, even though Democrats outpoll collectively the Republican I think candidates. we've got to stop calling it redistricting and gerrymandering. I think we should call it map scamming okay. because it, it we just good, need a, a really good way to explain how pernicious this is you know i mean it, it it's done in a really artful way mm -hmm. you've but poor, mm -hmm. poor uh, sam has heard me talk about redistricting for so many years it's just well that's awful. why the, that that case uh, the, the the ruling in north carolina uh, mm -hmm. is uh, important is, is an important. interesting one important one i mean there are other ones wisconsin I think Pennsylvania and some other places, but that could be sort of a, a real litmus test uh, as right. to whether it does you know, have to go to the probably right. will. Right, go but to still, the it is, it, just by talking about it or even getting to that level, it's kind of like right. uh, uh, already a little bit of a. But on Eleanor's there. point, I mean, that liberals in general, Democrats for sure, are not as good as conservatives in <laughs> labeling the you know map they scamming, mm -hmm. so that you know conservatives in a state tax becomes a death tax. You yeah. know? liberals have never good. been smart enough to call it a, a, a Kim Kardashian tax <laughs> or, uh, or something like that. And Sounds and like and, you're and, smart enough. Yeah, they <laughs> they need you, Clyde. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks to Clyde. Abram and Eleanor Randolph and David Chen of the New York Times for joining me and we'll be back with CODA in a moment. Where's Pat Moynihan now that we need him? Long before fake news became an epithet, the professorial United States Senator from New York famously defined veracity. People are entitled to their own opinions, Moynihan said, but not their own facts. Imagine what he'd be saying today. During the Reagan administration, Moynihan exposed the reason that Republicans were 
hypocritical to big budget deficits. Their goal, he argued, was to starve the beast, to cut taxes so drastically that there'd be no revenue left to pay for the social programs that Reagan couldn't get Congress to kill directly. The supply-side tax cuts, Republicans reasoned publicly, would give the wealthy people and corporations more money to spend on priming the economy. What the president didn't say explicitly, that the tax cuts would give the government less money to spend on health, housing, transportation, and other benefits that disproportionately help New York. Moynihan was more successful making another argument in the mid-1980s. Addressing the National League of Cities, he warned against what he called a profound constitutional error. The error, he argued, was to eliminate the deductibility of state and local levies from federal income taxes. That would put high-tax states like New York at a disadvantage because people who could afford to move would. He was so alarmed by the prospect that he began a Times op-ed essay this way. If you're looking for an apartment in Manhattan, help is on the way. I decided this was too alarmist and took the sentence out, Moynihan later recalled, but he wished he had not deleted it. Under Reagan, New York won the fight against eliminating deductibility. Last month, New Yorkers lost it. But Moynihan's conclusion remains as sound as ever. For all the talk about states' rights, eliminating revenue for the states, what Washington calls a federal subsidy, may mean the federal government will have to grow bigger, not smaller. Given the history of the first federal income tax passed in 1862, it might even be unconstitutional. Governor Cuomo correctly called this an economic civil war. We'll see in his budget whether he can outwit Washington. Will it not produce this huge and final irony, Moynihan asked, that the transfer of revenue resources to Washington inevitably concentrates more resources in the federal government, which will grow ever larger? For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.